started with that I met my wife uh, <laughs> uh, and I got to know that she uh, she worked as a fashion photographer so I got very interested in her profession mm -hmm. and she told me so many interesting stories about for example how the different fashion brands are the strategies of, of selling clothes uh, you know the part at the beginning when it comes to Balenciaga and H&M she told me, okay, have a look on the really expensive brands. What does, what does the models do? And they look always very, like, they look grumpy. They look, they look down on the consumer from above, you know? And uh, like an Aryan Eber bench, basically. And then you had the more cheaper brands, then the models are smiling. And you can see, like, the in-between, then the smile is disappearing from the face, and the more the expensive brand you get, the more grumpy they look. <laughs> and, and she said, that, okay, this is connected to, like, that we are buying a position in a hierarchy when we are buying clothes. Mm -hmm. So if we wanted to be on top of the pyramid, we're going to pay a lot of cash, but then we also can be on top of the pyramid and look down on the other ones that is below. And um, she also told me about the models. Uh, and I got especially interested in the stories that she had about male models. Uh, I thought it was interesting that uh, being a male model, then that, that's one of the few professions that you earn less than women. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and she told me about a friend of hers that uh, when he was 19 years old, he was working as a car mechanic. And he got street costed. So someone asked him, do you want to try out the, a model? And, and you know, the male model is not really a high status profession. So this guy goes, oh yeah, sure, I can try that. <laughs> Two years later, he's one of the best paid male models in the whole industry of, of fashion. And he does a class journey. You know, like his, his looks makes him elevate through class society. Uh, and the problem of being a model uh, is that the, the currency in the looks, it can fade away quite quickly. So uh, this guy, he gotten used to a kind of yet set life, uh, and uh, he, he very rapidly he moved up to this, this position, and he does a perfume campaign that makes him f very famous in, in, in the fashion world. Uh, and when he's up there, you know, have done this perfume campaign, people are, are starting to, to recognize him on the street. And uh, he realized, I'm losing my hair, I'm getting bored. I'm losing my currency. So he goes to his uh, agent and he talks to his agent about this problem. And the agent is uh, like looking at the hair problem and he says, okay, maybe you have two more years in the industry. Uh, and, but we have another problem also. And it is that you are so connected with this perfume company, the perfume brand. <coughs> so no one else wants to book you on the same level of yours. So in order to get your career going, it would be great if you get together with a famous girlfriend because then we can rebrand you. And for me, when I heard this, I'm born in the 70s, so I'm a little bit old fashioned, you know, I'm living love and things like that. <laughs> I, I was like, you know, uh, oh my God, what a cynical industry. I mean, <laughs> um, and so the, the, the term branded couple was, was something I got to know about. And I thought it would be interesting to make a movie where you can see that like the kind of economical system we have, like a kind of aggressive economical system, is like starting to go down in our most private uh, private parts also like that, that even in our like love relationship and so on we start to look at it as, as a transaction uh, as a business model uh, and i had very interesting experience when i pitched the film for uh first of all for people that was born in my generation i pitched the film and i said yeah we have carl and jaya and they are a branded couple and, and, and people in my generation, they, they, they tend to go like, oh, how horrible with a branded couple. What about love? <laughs> and then I teach it to millennials. Are there any millennials in here? Yeah, you are there. 
when I pitched it to you guys, and I said, yeah, then we have Paul and Jaya, and they are a branded couple. They may not live so you just go, yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so what's the, uh, what's the, what's the catch? Like, what, uh, and I don't know if it's the millennials that are cynical or if it's my generation that's very naive. You know? uh, uh, so, so it was these kind of things yeah. that was like, ah, okay, I want to make a movie that is discussing um, beauty as a currency, sexuality as a currency, how we look at human relationship as a transaction, and um, um, investigate this in three different environments, yeah. basically. Well, can you talk a little bit about the research that went into that? I know you did a lot of research on the like luxur luxury yacht uh, like economy. What was that process like for you? Well, um, it was a word that I didn't know anything about. Um, but um, and once again, my wife had been going on one of these cruises because she was shooting a, a famous actress. And uh, um, I thought it would be fun to make a movie that starts in the fashion world, goes to luxury world, and ends up on a deserted island. I, I want to do a movie like that. <laughs> I want to watch this movie. I want to make a movie like that. Um, so that, then I started to do some research on, on luxury yachts. It's the most absurd world that I ever have gotten into in my profession, because I, I think it's my, it's, it's my mission to try to understand everyone's behavior when it comes to uh, the characters that is in the field. And it's my profession, in my profession, it's my task to, to uh, also relate to all the characters, how absurd the behavior even can be. But I heard very interesting things. I have so many different stories about it. I can take take one that you um, that is about uh, one yacht. Um, I uh, uh, they told me that in the master bedroom they usually had a jacuzzi. They used to have a jacuzzi, and uh, but they had to move this jacuzzi away from the master bedroom. I asked why. Well, you know, everyone every time when then we had new guests. Um, and they very often asked if, they could, if we could fill up the jacuzzi with champagne. <laughs> and, and that was, you know, that, that was not the, 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 the big problem. The big problem actually started when it was one cruise where they wanted to fill up the uh, jacuzzi with champagne and put goldfishes in it. <laughs> and then the, the, the crew was feeling, I, I, I love that they had like this behavioristic approach to the problem. Maybe it's not good if we have the amount of jacuzzi in the master bedroom because it provokes a bad behavior from the guests. <laughs> so they actually moved the jacuzzi from the master bedroom. And then they, then they had less problems with like uh, goldfish and, and, and champagne and stuff like that. And, and I heard, you know, that what the sheets do, she has a pep talk in the beginning of the bit. Well, in, in, in the beginning of the part that starts with yours. And, you know, she says, uh, whatever the, the guests are requesting is yes sir, yes madam. If it's a unicorn or an in illegal substance, yes sir, yes madam. So if you ask um, uh, the crew on the luxury yacht for a unicorn, they will not say no. They would, they would try to solve the problem. <laughs> Maybe by hoping that the guest will forget what they have. But no is not actually not an answer that is allowed to say to the guests. Yeah. And. Uh, for example, they have to start with um, the, the yellow bag that is uh, uh, flown in with a helicopter. Uh, and uh, I thought it was fun to put Nutella in that bag. It's just <laughs> such an absurd thing to fly in in a helicopter. But, but the real inspiration for that was um, uh, there was someone that wanted a special bottle of wine that only in <laughs> now is sold in the other part of the planet. So they were flying it in, in with a plane and then with a helicopter and yeah. <laughs> so this kind of excessive, uh, absurd behavior is, uh, is something that exists in the world, basically. I wanted to ask two of them, them moving the action to the deserted island and sort of, what were you thinking about sort of how you wanted to flip the power structures once you got on there? Once you got on there, and how did that shift filming? How did that sort of change the environment? Well, I, I think that what 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 is interesting when you make movies and when you look at us and our behavior is to create turning points. So as soon as you create the turning point, you're also giving the audience a new perspective of the same kind of setup that you have already given to them. And, and, and the deserted island have been used so many times in literature and movies and so on. 
in, in a way of like taking away own hierarchies. So you have the strong hierarchies of the fashion world and you have the strong hierarchies of the luxury world. And I was very fond of the idea that these people that are the creme de la creme of our society that is really good at taking pictures of themselves, for example, and looking good in these pictures. And, and uh, uh, the people that have all this money and, and to get to the deserted island when uh, it's about know-how that is the strongest currency. And it's about uh, how to survive that become the strongest currency. And you look at these people that actually are the ones that are producing things in the world, yeah. that is that have the lowest wage in our society, and the one that have the highest wage in our society are the one that is distributing income rather than producing it, something. Yeah. And I love the idea about getting to the island and put the one that actually are the one that are producing something in the top of the hierarchy. Um, and I love the idea, you know, to let this oligarch, this, this, this Russian capitalist, to all of a sudden say these Marxist quotes, you know, <laughs> from each according to their ability to each according to their needs. And all of a sudden their rhetoric would change yeah. in order to get, get part of the fish. And, yeah. Well, I think we have time for a couple of audience questions, if anyone has any. I'll see right here. <laughs> you can go. more of the aftermath of the dinner, um, I have to ask. <laughs> um, I noticed there was a juxtaposition between the kind of um, upsetting behavior and the more raucous news that was going on. Um, I was wondering what kind of um, inspired you to make that decision and to show those two kind of side by side instead of going with the music that was presented earlier, which is more light, going along with the theme of um, being in the hierarchical society, like you said, with more fancy people. So mm -hmm. that kind of change okay. is intriguing to me. So I wondered what made that decision for you. Uh, just to repeat the question for the audience, uh, it was about the music in the vomiting sequence. I think we can <laughs> <laughs> all talk. We, we all talk. We can talk about vomit. <laughs> OK, I will tell you the secret now. You have to promise to not tell it to anyone else. Because <laughs> I, I can end up in trouble then. <laughs> From the beginning, I really, really wanted Race Against, against Machine, Aww. killing in the name of. <laughs> and I love the idea that we should see the cleaning ladies like scrubbing up this vomit, and you hear, fuck you, I won't do what you tell me. Fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> and um, it's something with that Race Against Machine song, because wherever you are in society, oh, oh, also the richest billionaire wants a revolution when you hear it, right? And I thought it was such a great trigger to have that song like playing out, you know, ah, and uh, um, pushing forward to this, the, the climax of the storm and the climax of the vomiting. And so I wanted to have a certain kind of, how do you say, maybe a romantic re revolution idea, <laughs> and like playing on what's in all of us in some way. You know, like it, that idea about like, no, this is not right, it's a weird fight, you know? Um, um, and we were working quite long to get uh, Rage Against Machine to allow us to have that song. And we were, I was writing very nice letters to them. <laughs> and I think, it was, I think it was two weeks before the premiere, we got a no. Aww. And I had to find another song uh, to put into the film. And then I, it's a Swedish punk rock band called The Refused. And they, um, it's quite good also, I think. <laughs> and, and then I got so angry when I realized that uh, Rage Against Machine, they have their song in the end credits of Matrix 2? <laughs> Come on, what is your political engagement? <laughs> like, here we have a Marxist captain ranting the communistic manifest to vomiting passengers of the luxury yacht. Isn't this fitting your idea, like your political uh, position? Um, yeah. Um, if you ask the actress Dolly de Leon, she says yes, she did. Uh, but personally, I, I have actually never decided, or I have not even been very interested in if she does it or not. 
because what I wanted to do was to try to make the audience identify with the possibility of doing it. And uh, I think a lot of my work as a director, as I said before, I want to be able to identify with all the characters' actions. I want to be able to identify myself if I was an arms dealer and I was trying to motivate what I'm doing. What would I say? Um, probably would say our products have been involved in many fights for democracy all over the world. <laughs> and if I'm uh, on the top of the hierarchy, on this deserted island, and all of a sudden I'm getting uh, uh, these advantages, and have this hot young boyfriend, uh, and uh, I can go back to the normal world, but then I have to climb down the ladder again. Could I identify with Abigail that she maybe would use violence in order to maintain her position? And uh, to end the film in that dilemma uh, was something that I, that I knew that I wanted to do. Uh, and so, so for me, it's not very important what she, what she does. She can do either or. And it's a tragedy in all cases. Because it's a tragedy if she uses violence, and it's a tragedy in some ways that she has to climb down the ladder again. And uh, uh, it's a classical dilemma, basically. And I love using dilemmas when I make movies, because dilemmas is, if you describe it simplified, it's a situation that is easy to, de to identify with, but hard to handle. If you think of a dilemma, it always contains of more than uh, one possibility, two or more possibilities, but none of them are easy. And whatever you do, it will have consequences. So dilemmas is something that is very efficient uh, to use in, in, in script, script writing and, and scenes uh, in movies. We have time for one more. I saw a hand up. Go right up there. Really like the performances you got on. Can you tell us a little about your rehearsal process with the actors? Question about the rehearsal process. What I do is that I'm, I'm very involved in the casting. So already from, from, from the casting, I get try to get to know the actors. And I try to be open to who they are and what their expression is. And uh, many of the actors that is in this film have done something surprising with the character that I couldn't expect and that, that we have worked along with. I don't like to work against, like, if you're trying to get an actor that should fit in my imagination, and then you're trying to push in the actor in, in that character. Uh, so so I, I don't like to work in that way. I rather like, what are the specific qualities in this actor that maybe is also surprising to the role? So for example, Slavko Burich that plays the Dimitri, he was a much more softer, warmer uh, oligarch than I was thinking from the beginning. And um, uh, then, what I do is that I like to improvise first around the situations. I ask them to get to know as much as possible about who they are and which position they are in a materialistic setup. Not who they are, like who my father was, or blah, blah, blah. Okay, it can be important from a materialistic setup also, but rather, okay, this is your profession. Where are you in the higher economical and the social structure? Uh, uh, who are under you, who are above you? Uh, what are you used to? What kind of treatment are you used to? Uh, and things like that. And then um, what we do when we, before we shoot the scenes, um, I sit together with them and read through the scene that we're going to shoot the following day. And we are tr I'm trying to explain to them what, I'm, what I want to try to capture, what I, try to, what I want to try to express. Uh, and uh, we are maybe changing some things because my English is not perfect, so sometimes the, uh, the English-speaking actors can give me some advice. And, um, and uh, uh, then the next day when we go on set, and we put up the camera, and we start shooting the scene, when I look on the monitor, when they are saying the lines, everything is once again changing completely. Because then it is like the distance between the characters and how they are positioned in the frame are going to change the setup. And sometimes, you know, the script is actually not 100% accurate when you look on how they are positioned in the frame. And I like to work with a master. I like to work with a big image so I can see all the actors uh, in, in that master. Um, because then I feel more like a sociologist when I'm shooting. I feel like, ah, I'm looking at human behavior. Do I believe in this? 
would this be possible that it happens? If I'm only looking at the face, then I can lie much more. Because then, then, I can, then, then what's out of the screen you can hide. And you can con construct something that is not 100% true. But if you have a master shot that is big, then, uh, then I can't lie in the same way. Because then it, will, then it will be visualized immediately. We see immediately if something doesn't work 100%. And I love what the actors are saying, for example, sorry, I can't do this that, that it says in the script. It's not possible for me as a human being. Uh, uh, because then I can say, ah, great, can we change the setup in some way so it is possible for you as a human being? I always want them to ask themselves, for me as a human being, is it possible? Not as this character. I don't want them to put the behavior outside of themselves. I want them to do the same thing that I try to do. I try to understand why they do as they do. Is it possible for me as a human being? <clears throat> and then I, I would call this a way of directing a sociological approach to directing rather than a um, psychoanalytical way of, of directing. Uh, a much more like um, uh, uh, nature filming, if you film animals, you know, <laughs> the buffaloes and lions and the savannah, you look curiously on how they behave, and you can have sympathy for the lion when it's catching a little buffalo, and you have sympathy for the buffalo that is going to die, but, but you're looking at it like more from an uh, anthropological and, and sociological way, and the same way I'm doing when I'm uh, rehearsing with actors. Well, thank you all so much for being here, and thank you. Thank you.